We often hear that the Buddha taught two kinds of meditation techniques, samatha or tranquility techniques, and vipassana or insight techniques. But you look through the Pali Canon and you're not going to find them. There's no place where the Buddha says, go do samatha or go do vipassana. What he does say is, go do jhana. It's in the practice of right concentration that you develop both tranquility and insight. You need some tranquility and you need some insight in order to get into jhana. And then as the jhana deepens, as you get more skilled at it, the tranquility gets more intense. And the opportunities for insight will also get advanced. Because after all, what is tranquility? It's learning how to settle in, be established, be steady. You think about the term for jhana, it's related to the verb jayati, which means a steady flame, or the burning of a steady flame. As for insight, the Buddha defines it as looking into certain questions about fabrication. How should fabrications be seen? How should they be investigated? And how should they be penetrated through insight? And when we look at the practice of jhana, we can see why it fosters both tranquility and, and insight. The tranquility is obvious. Things are really still. Think of those images of the, the lotuses in that pool of water that are perfectly still, saturated with water from the roots to the tips. Or the person with the white cloth surrounding his body is lying very still. But as you practice concentration, you also learn a lot about fabrication. It's a hands-on kind of experience. You don't sit there watching fabrications passively. You use fabrications in order to get the mind to settle in. Think of the three kinds of fabrication. There's the breath. That's bodily fabrication. Okay, you're focused on the breath. Then there's verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation. That's how you talk to yourself. And that's one of the factors of the first jhana, or two of the factors of the first jhana. And then there's mental fabrication feelings or perceptions, and the states of right concentration all the way up through the dimension of nothingness are called perception attainments. And the different levels of jhana are defined by the feeling tone. Pleasure and rapture in the first jhana, more pleasure and rapture in the second, just pleasure in the third, equanimity in the fourth. So you're dealing with these fabrications. Get some hands-on experience. And once you see how you can create a state of concentration out of these different kinds of fabrication, and you understand what you're doing in those terms, and the Buddha encourages that, then you can apply the same lessons to other things that are coming up, and particularly those questions around insight. The Buddha teaches a five-step program for dealing with anything that is a problem for the mind or is a disturbance. You start out with things that are obvious problems, and you work your way up to the more subtle ones, until finally there's nothing left but the path itself, the states of concentration, the activity of discernment. And you apply the same five-step program to those things. That's when you're really free. So when you start with something obvious, say lust comes into the mind, you want to see how it originates. And the origination is not to be found out there in the sensory experience. It's to be found in here in the mind. What is it about the mind that goes for these things? And then you see how it passes away, when the cause passes away. And it comes back again when the cause comes back. What you're really interested in is the next two steps. seeing the allure and seeing the drawbacks. Now the allure again, it's not to be found out there necessarily. It's expressed in those three fabrications as well. Where certain things come up and there's a feeling tone in the body that goes along with them, a breath energy feeling. 
And sometimes a certain thought is appealing just because of that. Other times it's how you talk to yourself about it, about your thought and evaluation. The stories you can tell yourself, say, around a particular object of lust. And you realize that the allure is not so much in the object, it's in the stories. Or it can be mental fabrication, the images, the perceptions that go around it, the feelings that go around it. You're really more interested in those than you are, again, with the object. And advertisers realize this when they sell something. That often you look at the advertisement and there's very little of the actual object that they're selling in the advertisement, and there's an awful lot of images, perceptions, associations that they want us to make with the object to make it desirable. So that's the psychology of the allure. So many times you're going to be embarrassed about what you see, how you fabricate the allure, because you are fabricating it. You think about food. You can think about food in certain ways, and it's pretty disgusting. But in order to get yourself to want to eat it, to fix it and everything, you have to think about it in ways that make it really attractive. And a lot of the pleasure in eating comes from our anticipation. And then we think about it afterwards, what a great meal that was, as a way of setting us up for the next meal. So it's all in the direct of thought and evaluation and the perceptions. Now, if this were all we had, we'd say, well, who cares about the drawbacks? I'll go for this. But the Buddha reminds us that there is a greater pleasure to be found by developing dispassion for these things. This is why we always have to think about the Buddhist teachings in the context of the Four Noble Truths, because they set out the options that are available to us. And one of them is total freedom from suffering based on dispassion. So this is where you're willing to look at the drawbacks of the things that have you hooked. And just as the allure is built largely out of directed thought and evaluation, the looking at the drawbacks, you have to talk to yourself. And you have to bring other images in mind, other perceptions in mind. And this is why the three perceptions are, are play such a huge role. They and the other perceptions that are derived from them, seeing things as alien, as a disease, as an arrow, as a dissolution. These are all variations on inconstancy, stress, not self. Or you can talk to yourself about things. You can remember some of the things that the Buddha said about how many tears you've shed going from one life to the next to the next based on the allure of sensuality or the allure of whatever you're looking for. And it's all pretty empty. You create the allure and then you go running for it. It's like that story of the sculptor who sculpted a beautiful woman and then fell in love with her, even though he knew that it was a total creation of his. That's the way we are. So you can think of that story of all the tears we've shed, more than the water in the oceans, all the blood we've shed, going for sensual pleasures in ways that are dishonest, against the law. We get caught. They cut off our heads. The blood that's flowed from our necks and our heads is more than all the waters in the ocean. Sobering thought. But the whole purpose of that is to provide new ways of imaging in the mind around issues of whatever the defilement is. The Buddha has this long series of similes for the drawbacks of sensuality. It's like a dog gnawing on a bone. In the John Lee's explanation of the image, it has no flavor in the bone except for its own saliva. And again, we're the ones providing the allure. We paint our allure on things, and then we fall for it. Sensuality is like a hawk that's got a little piece of meat, and other hawks come and try to get the meat away from them. 
It's like a, a bead of honey on the blade of a knife. A little bit of sweetness and a lot of danger. So those are the images that the Buddha wants you to use. That's the kind of verbal fabrication and mental fabrication he wants you to use to counteract the verbal fabrication and the mental fabrication that go into the allure. And when you're devoted to seeing the drawbacks as much as possible, because you know there's something better on the other side, there will come a point where the drawbacks seems so great and the allures just seem so futile, because after all it's nothing, it's, it's a total creation. Oftentimes we're lying to ourselves about these things, and yet we suffer for them. Do you want to keep on lying? Do you want to keep on suffering from your lies? That's the basic question. And that's how dispassion can be developed, and it's through dispassion that we have our escape. And that's vipassana, that's insight. Digging around in fabrications like this to develop this passion and overcome our ignorance over what we're doing. What we're doing to ourselves. So it's because the practice of concentration sets us up gets us sensitive to the processes of fabrication, and puts us in a good state of mind. After all, we're talking about pleasure, rapture, equanimity, which are good feeling tones to be coming from when you're doing this kind of analysis, because otherwise the mind is just too hungry for the pleasure, and so it's too hungry for the allure to admit to itself what the allure is. Or for or to allow the drawbacks really to seep in. But when you've softened up the mind a little bit, with comfortable breathing, with comfortable thoughts, then you're ready for insight. The kind of insight that really does make a difference. So that's how the practice of jhana does develop both samatha and vipassana, both tranquility and insight. So go to jhana. That's how the Buddha ended many of his talks. And he continued by saying, take advantage of the time while you have it. Don't let there be any regret later on.